Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? Now, my guest today needs no introduction with a passing interest in science, especially here in Australia. Now, he's a physicist, a doctor, an engineer, and an inventor, but they're only a sample of the jobs that he's done in the past. He's a writer of books of science, and he's nationally known as a public speaker. He's spoken on national TV and public radio, and he's watched and listened to by hundreds of thousands of people regularly as he shares stories of science. He was named Australian Father of the Year, is a member of the Order of Australia. He's even had an asteroid named after him, and he was named as one of Australia's national living treasures. His name is, of course, Karl Krusenitsky, but most of you will know him as simply as Dr. Karl. Welcome, Karl. Ahoy, Dr. Paul. Lovely to be with you. <laughs> so, look, you, list, you carry many hats, you've got many degrees, but let's say you turn up to a company where people don't know you. What's the first response you give to someone when they say, hey, what do you do for a living? Um, I t- say I'm a storyteller. And what stories do you tell? Um, stories from the lands of science, medicine and engineering. Say about Murphy's Law, how the total number of people that have been alive and been born and died since 50,000 years ago is, wait for it, 100 billion. How there's animals that have to grow a new anus every time they want to have a, a poo. And how most of the black holes in our galaxy are missing. There should be a billion, we've only found three dozen. So, I mean, in essence, you're a science communicator. You, you've gotten to that role by a fairly circuitous route. Like you started with a physics degree and then you moved into a medical degree. Now your full-time job is more or less uh, science communication. How did you get into science communication particularly? I, my understanding is actually on a serious note, there was actually a, something that happened in a hospital that actually made you want to go into science communication. Well, that was there later, but you left out the... Um uh, most of my 16 years of university, uh, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No big <laughs> deal, but just trying to get the story right. <laughs> so um, I did a degree in physics and maths and then went off into a whole bunch of different things, taxi yeah. driver, labourer, car mechanic, made some of the first um, movies for TV, you know, music videos for TV in Australia. Um, at the Aquarius Arts Festival, set up Australia's first cable TV network back in 1972. Um, drifted into the hospital system, um, did stuff there, was fascinated by the human body, um, went into doing biomedical engineering, designed and built a machine for Fred Hollows to pick up electrical signals off the human retina. And um, then at the end of that time, I had a few, two different pathways. One was either do a PhD, I had three PhD offers in biomedical engineering, or go into medicine. And so um, I decided to go down the medicine pathway and I wrote a letter to NASA saying, hi, NASA, um, I've got a degree in physics and math or math for our overseas listeners. And I've also got a degree, a master's degree in engineering when I designed and built a machine to pick up electrical signals off the human retina. And I'm a fit young bloke. Um, can I be an astronaut? I'm doing a medical degree, by the way. I'll be a doctor and surgeon in a couple of years. And they wrote me back a letter, which I still have today, a, ret- a letter written um, on a typewriter. Uh, and signed by a human being saying we're all full up and anyway we only employ Americans and then I heard that um, Double J was doing a launch covering the launch of the very first space shuttle which is something I've been following for many years been fascinated watching it slowly come to fruition so I rang him up and I said I do believe that you're doing this as part of the International Year of Transport. I didn't know that 1981 was the International Year of Transport, but there you go. And um, they said, yeah, come on down and talk. And so I started talk, came down and talked to them. And they said, come out the back room, we'll start recording. And they kept on going. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know your stuff. Um, do you want to come in and cover the launch of the space shuttle? So I went in to cover the launch of the space shuttle. And this was a big deal. It isn't as though you're lying in bed and you think, oh, there's something happening somewhere else in the world. I'll look at it on my phone. No, no, no. Here they had had to negotiate um, lines from uh, California up to the satellite down to Hawaii, from Hawaii up to the satellite down to Sydney, and then across into the ABC studio. And this took a lot of mucking around. 
you know, it wasn't an overnight job. So there we are listening to the launch and suddenly they cancelled it due to a problem with the fuel cell. Everybody's looking at each other in the studio. What's a fuel cell? Luckily, I knew what a fuel cell was. Handy thing nowadays in our land of electric cars. Basically, a fuel cell is a box that turns fuel, usually hydrogen, into electricity and water and has no moving parts apart from the actual fuel itself, the hydrogen and the oxygen which come in and the uh, water which comes out. And then they thought well, that was cool. Came back about a week and a half later. They'd fixed up the problem with the fuel cell, the auxiliary power unit. And then they did the launch. They took off and we're out the back, successful launch. We're out the back having a cup of tea and heavy tea. In fact, and one of the producers said, well, I really need this tea to clean my kidneys. Um, I, I'd actually studied physiology. Which is, have, you, have you done physiology? I have actually, yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing subject, isn't it? I love it. I love it. Yep. Yeah. I had no idea um, before I did it that the human body was full of all this complicated stuff. I thought it was just some sort of amorphous, chunky red salsa which leaked out if you happened to get in a fight on TV or in a movie and people would fire bullets and your stuff would leak out. And there's all these complicated machines in there. And I said, well, actually, um, it's not so much that the um, tea is cleaning your kidneys, but rather that your kidneys filter a quarter of a tonne of blood every day. And then, as part of that, they pull out an enormous one and a half kilograms of salt, which is a lot of effort, you know, um, enormous metabolic cost. And then they negate it all by putting practically all of it back in, except for a tiny fraction of one gram, 80 thousandth of a gram. And the reason they do this is because God made a mistake or evolution made a mistake in where fish gone wrong. And he said, ah, we need you for a show called Great Moments in Science, which at that time on Double J was a show on Saturday afternoons with um, Gail Austin um, uh, playing music topless in the studio to black and white movies on Channel 10. And so then I drifted into that, and that's how my media career started. Um, and then after about uh, four or five years, when I was doing all these stories, because uh, there's so many interesting stories in medicine and science, a book publisher uh, rang me up and said, hey, can I turn your stories into a book? And I said, sure. And then he sent a, one off to the ABC TV, and the ABC TV rang me up and said, hey, do you want to come and go on TV um, in our new TV series? Uh, I said, nah. And then I rang, thought about it and said, okay. And so then I went on that for a year and then went back into medicine and then went down the medical pathway and then worked in various hospitals as a student. Then as a real doctor, very junior doctor, then went to the kids' hospital, still a junior doctor. And I was there, uh, the thing that you alluded to, when after a period of 20 years of zero deaths from whooping cough in all of Australia. Now think about that. The number of humans who died from whooping cough for 20 years was zero. And then because Channel 9 wanted to get more advertising on a current affair to sell more dog food, they started uh, telling lies that there's two sides to the vaccine story. There aren't. Mm. Um, I mean, seven times two is 14. It's not 13.9. There's no two sides to the multiplication tables. There's just the one side. And um, I was there on, a, I think it was a Tuesday morning when about two o'clock when the baby died and the parents were just heartbroken. And I couldn't bear to say, well, mate, it's a current affair that killed your baby so they can sell more dog food. Mm. I thought that was a fairly heartless thing to say. So I said other things. Um, but then I started moving more out of the hospital system and then into um, TV. But then I did a bit of a detour um, and became a test driver for four-wheel drive vehicles in the Australian Outback for a couple of decades. And here I am. Oh. Now, in that mix, there's a... A job that you haven't mentioned yet. You, what about your roadie experience with Bo Diddley? That was amazing. So I was with a band um, called the um, And Band and then later being a, their roadie and then also a waste of days. And then the deal was that Bo Diddley would fly to Australia and then pick up a band to be his blues band to back him. And I was the roadie for them, so therefore I was the roadie for him. And we travelled around um, doing uh, roadieing and gigs at different places and I, I remember on one occasion he was saying to the guys who were really, you know, quite skilled musicians, very skilled musicians and quite creative, um, he said to them, hey, guys, I mean, you know, you've got to dress up a bit, man, none of these dirty clothes and stuff, you know, sort of get clean and do a few you know, manoeuvres on stage, you know, one, two, three, kick, walk, kick while playing the music. And they weren't quite into it, but they sort of got the idea and they got into it after a while. And on one occasion I said to him, hey, Bo, look, I've heard you play this song about 50 times. 
And each time you play it with the same enthusiasm that you played it the very first time I heard you play it. I said, how do, you, how do you keep it going? He said, look, Carl, it's not show fun or show play. It's show biz. That's what they call it, show biz. They give me money, and what they want is a good time. And if I give them a good time, they're happy. I'm happy. We're all happy. What's not to like? I think he didn't say that. What that's what not what to like. I think I made that bit up. But the point was that um, if you went in and did things as well as you could, in many cases, everybody would be happy. Mm. And that was a great lesson from um, wonderful Bo. Yeah. You've got such a diverse career, and what comes out again? You do something, and you move on to something else. You move on to something else, and you go back, and so forth. What's the thought process on going on? Is it like you're getting a little bit bored about what you're doing and want something new and exciting? Or is it just opportunities arise and you're just exploring? What's, what's the process that's going in your mind as to what drives you to go and do different things? Uh, boredom, <laughs> uh, creative boredom, um, combined with being heavily influenced. I tried to, have you ever read Plato's Republic? No, I haven't. I tried. It's too hard. But anyway, there was one phrase that really stuck in my mind, which was the unexplored life is not worth living. At the time, I was working as a physicist at the steelworks, testing the steel for a bridge that would later fall down, the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne. By the way, it's still made of inferior steel. Um, And so I was testing it and then working in this place. And I suddenly realized, not suddenly, I gradually realized over a period of time that there were two major groups of people working around me at all levels and one bunch of people were living. And in the last five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, they'd had five, 10 or 20 or 15 or whatever years of life. And the other people were just going through the motions. And even though they'd been there for 20 years, they hadn't had 20 years of life. They had one year of life experienced 20 times. And I thought, Oh my God, they grow gray ghosts. They're, oh, there's some English writer of the 50s who wrote about that grey ghost, I can't remember who it is, and it scared the heck out of me, and I decided I would live. And when I – so I go into a job, and basically, you know nothing. So when um, uh, I I went to meet Fred Hollows for the electroretinogram, um, he said, hey, Carl, you know how to build an electroretinogram? I said, got no idea what it is. What is it? He says, "Uh, ah, you pick up electrical signals off the human retina. And I'm kind of thinking electrical signals. Yep. The body makes electrical signals off the human retina. Well, it's pretty easy to pick up electrical signals off the heart. What you do is you get a human and you stick one foot in a bucket of salt water. And then you chuck an electrode into that salt water and aim it at your, put it to your measuring machine. And then you get a bit of sandpaper and you clean a bit of skin off their chest. And then you get some jelly with some salt in it and a bit of the gaffer tape, and then you just shove it on their chest, and you stick another wire in that. And you, so you've got the two wires, and then you can pick up electrical signals off the heart. The eye, never heard of anybody doing that, and I immediately thought people would get a bit scared if you came at them with a bit of sandpaper paper, trying to shiny up their um, cornea to get a bit of better electrical activity. So I said, uh, look, um, I don't know anything about it. I reckon, uh, give me a year, I reckon I could work out what to do, and then give me another year, I can build it. And that's the way it worked out. Um, so each pathway, um, can have a beginning and a middle and end. And sometimes depending on the job, it can just keep on going and expanding. So, so like my position at the university of Sydney as, um, the Julius Sumner Miller fellow mm-hmm. has been going for about a quarter of a century, which is the longest time I've ever had a job before then it was about two years. In most cases, after about a year and a half, I've, uh, I'm prepared to move on. Um, I've, I can, I've learned everything I can, um, and I want to expand the job. And so I was working at the hospital, uh, as a scientific officer in the cardiology laboratory. Um, we were part of a team shoving pipes up people's uh, legs and up their aorta and then chucking you in, coming down to their heart and measuring the blood pressure, or, or, or injecting dye in their heart. And because of my experience as a filmmaker, and processing the film, I, we had film in those days. That, that's why they took me on. And I was working on ways to make the job better. I said, look, I've got some ideas here. And the boss said, no, nah, we like it just the way it is. Done, mate. You, whatever you want, you get. And within six months, I was out of there and uh, working for Fred Hollows instead. You also th- tried to build a perpetual motion machine? Anti-gravity machine. Anti-gravity machine. 
How did that with go? Craig McLennan. He was the brains behind it. I was just helping him along. Um, and so he put in 5,000 bucks, which is probably about 40,000 bucks a day, which I got by driving taxis and he got by being a geologist. And it was a rather clever idea. On one hand, you can do the fancy theoretical stuff and think gravity, tensors, all forms, sorts of fancy stuff. Or you can do an experiment. And he said that um, if you've got a mass, then that will curve the space around it, and then light will follow that curved space. He said, what if we run it backwards? What if we create curved space? Will we be able to measure any change in gravity? Um, and I ran a past a few professors of physics and they said no idea do the experiment and after the third one said just do it i said okay we just got to do it so we went and did it uh and it didn't work changing tax slightly um what science inspires you all of it it's amazing oh god yes you know biology and um quantum mechanics and um, virology and hematology and geology. I just love reading a a any new discovery from that whole world of, of expanding knowledge because science is not a bunch of facts. That's an encyclopedia. Science is a way of understanding the universe. And we're still sort of, I'm, I'm hanging out in physics for something to turn up that doesn't make sense because there's just, there's, there's too many problems in physics. Like, we don't know what dark matter is, which is 25% of the universe roughly, or we don't know what dark energy is, which is about 70%. Don't fully understand why neutrinos have mass. There's a whole lot. The muon is still a problem. I, I think that's just a measuring problem, but still. But And and the Hubble's got a bit of a problem. The Hubble constant, I reckon that's just a measuring problem. Well, and when I say I, the clever people whom I respect reckon that. I don't know anything about any area of physics. I just simply go along with what the clever people in each say, Phil say that's the overwhelming majority of the people. And so that's how I found myself in the situation with climate change. I find myself just going along with the overwhelming majority of the climatologists. Mm. If they reckon that global warming or climate change is real and we cause it, sure. If you reckon as a metallurgist that if you want to turn iron ore into steel, it's a two-part process. At the moment, you add carbon to get rid of the oxygen, then you add, add oxygen to get rid of the carbon. That's a complicated sentence. I can take you through that later. And then you add 18 chrome and 18% nickel to turn it into stainless, where you get, end up with a rust that is both adherent and non-porous. And so even though stainless steel is rusted, it doesn't look like it. So in each case, I'll believe whatever they tell me. Uh, so I'm not an expert in anything. So just flipping that question over, and I'm thinking of what your answer is, but I'm giving you the opportunity. Is there any science that you find boring or at least overrated? Um, well, the only really real science, of course, is physics. I'm just saying that because I'm in the school of physics. Now, but now I'll tell you the truth. The only real, real, real science is mathematics. Right, And then a little bit softer than that is physics. And then you work your way down into chemistry, which is the physics of the outer electron. So it's all still physics. And then you work your way down into biology, which is really complicated. And so it's so hard to know what's going on. And then you go into interpretations of that, which can include things like psychology and evolutionary biology. And I wouldn't call them overrated. I'm calling them the best thing that we can do with a really difficult problem because trying we're trying to solve the problem of what the brain is and does using that tool that we call the brain. I mean, what other instrument can you use to uh, diagnose itself? So none. So it, I wouldn't call them overrated, but de definitely mathematics is, is the one, is the most beautiful one followed by physics. Uh, do you have a favourite equation? Uh, if I have a favourite equation, oh gosh, uh, that's you know, firing back at me. My favourite equation, if I fully understand it, I mean, look, there's a lots of equations, but you know, obviously, there's the cl the classic usually e equals m c squared. Obviously, that's just the shortened version of it. That's uh, beauty. That's I know. That's it's just it's just elegant. Just, it's elegant. It's that's so right. That. It's so simple and elegant. Um, it's actually the short form. The, 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 the real right. version is a bit longer, but longer. That's right. That's yeah. fine. 
Now, um, that's my normally my standard question to mathemat- mathematicians. <laughs> uh, the, the second one is, what is your your Erdish number? But I won't go into that. And um, one lady, uh, when I asked her what her favourite equation was, she rolled up her sleeve. And on her arm, on the inside of her forearm, she had tattooed Y equals, and then a vertical line, function X, you know, Y equals, hang on, Y equals vertical line F, and then a bracket, X, close bracket, uh, and then another vertical line. So I said, what does that mean? She said, well, go on, have a go. I said, Y equals the positive value of function X. She said, that's right. Always be positive. Oh, very good. Isn't that, isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> What's your favorite equation? Oh, I'm a bit of a wuss. I, I just go for the standard Euler equation. E to the I pi plus one equals zero. Absolutely astonishing. Like Euler was this blind mathematician uh, who had 17 children, several of whom died, and probably one of the most prolific mathematicians, although Erdish was pretty good. Um, and so you got, you got three of the fundamental constants that run the universe, like E, I, and pi. And you've got the basis of counting, one and zero. And you've got the basis of algebra plus and equal. So E to the I pi plus one equals zero. Mate, all those three things just in uh, half a dozen symbols. God, is beautiful. <laughs> now, I want to move on a little bit more to your background. So you're an mm-hmm. only child. You, you hail from Poland and you moved to Australia after the Second World War. Uh, your parents are, in fact, are Holocaust survivors. What in your childhood gave you that passion for science? What, how, did, how did that develop? Um, I'll put it all down to science fiction and fairy tales. So what happened was that at an early age, um, I started reading through the fairy tales of the world at the local Wollongong library and blow me down. It was quite astonishing as a seven year old to start reading about the fairy tales of the world because there are a couple of hundred countries and there were amazing similarities and differences even though the countries were halfway across the world from each other. And, of course, from there, I immediately graduated into science fiction, and they just kept on feeding me with science fiction, you know, like what could, and then what could be here, what could be that. And then the background of that is you look at the world around you and you think, ah, the sky's blue, but why isn't it pink? Uh, I've got two legs. Why don't I have three? When I drop something, it falls down why doesn't it fall up so science is basically just a process of understanding the world by asking questions and i think science fiction is possibly the best way to get into it so are you a science fiction fan i do like science fiction i'm not a big avid reader i'm too busy (laughs) these days but i do enjoy good science fiction what's your favorite book if well maybe ask what when you were growing up what was the the stories that you gravitated most to was there one book that you particularly loved well, the very first science fiction story I read really stayed stuck in my mind called Thunderbolt of the Starways uh, or the Spaceways, and that kept on going. And favorite book at the moment I'm um, reading, uh, the person from whom I get most of my moral and spiritual guidance, Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography, Total Recall. And that's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> uh, he's really... Um, the movie was pretty good. The book was even better. They were all good. Um, the book, the movie was actually pretty darn good. But his book, the autobiography, is nothing to do with the movie. Um, and uh, he's got a really good lesson in there, which he doesn't actually say. But when you think about it, the reason that he got to having his big, beautiful muscles was not by lying down, watching TV, drinking beer, um, but rather by actually going out there and doing it. And that's a good lesson. Some people don't ever get that lesson. Obviously, with uh, your, all the stories you tell, I mean, anyway, you do science communication, which is all about telling stories. You won a prize on a particular one, uh, not the Nobel Prize, but the Ig Nobel Prize in 2002. Um, on, of all things, belly button lint. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about belly button lint and, and how did you get to that prize? Um, because I'm a world expert on it, uh, to a very limited degree, very limited. Um, so um, on Triple J, somebody rang up uh, saying, um, how come i got belly button lint or fluff and how come it's always blue? And I said um, the right thing, which was, I, had, I don't know. 
no idea. So I went looking through the literature, and after a couple of weeks, I was able to find one lousy article, one, in the Christmas issue of the British Medical Journal. Um, and there was a bunch of people talking about it, writing about it. I'm um, not doing any research, but there was one hint, which was that in the same, this was pretty close to the original sentence, in the same way that all roads lead to Rome, all hair on the abdomen leads to the belly button. And I didn't know where to go with it because I'm not a very deep thinker. I'm not very smart. So I, I know a lot. Knowledgeable? Yes. Smart? No. Uh, I, I know smart people. I've worked with them in medicine. I've worked with them in physics. They're smart. I'm not. I know where I stand. And so um, I reported this back on Triple J saying, well, here's a story. All roads lead to Rome. And then I left it at that. Still don't know. And then about three months later, somebody who was smarter than me, um, Doug, from the Soft Bottom Research Centre, which is not people who go around the streets poking people in the buttocks to see if they're hard or soft, but rather scientists or fishologists or ichthyologists who deal with fish that live on, live on soft, sandy bottoms. So Doug was from the Soft Bottom Research Centre, um, not people going around the street poking people in the buttocks to see if they're hard or soft, but rather um, a, a fish scientist looking at fish that live on soft, sandy bottoms rather than hard, rocky bottoms. And quite separately from that, he had a bit of a hairy abdomen. He was a little bit overweight. And he'd actually done the experiment, big it up for you, Doug. And what he'd done was he'd shaved a 10-centimetre circle around his belly button. He used to be a prolific generator of belly button fluff. <laughs> Shave this 10 centimeter circle, like the distance across your knuckles, nothing, no belly button fluff. And then as the um, hair grew back, then so too did the belly button fluff production increase. So we started up a survey, um, which was to, at our own expense, um, ask a whole lot of questions. And 5,000 people answered and 3,500 uh, generated belly button fluff. And it turned out that the prolific, the most prolific generator of belly button fluff was the slightly overweight male um, with a hairy abdomen. But there was a case of a young female who was totally hairless uh, in that region. And um, however, used to wear tight T-shirts, very tight T-shirts. And would generate belly button fluff until, wait for it, she put a ring in her navel. Mm. And then the ring acted like a little tent pole and held the T-shirt up. And suddenly she got no belly button fluff. So this was a hint. Um, and then there was another story. Uh, it, something popped up in the statistics that if you had a top loader washing machine, you got... Uh, more belly button fluff than if you had a front loader. Are you, you into washing machines, Paul? Yeah, well, into them. I use them for sure. And yes, the lint is always there. You know about the difference between the top loader and the front loader? Um, uh, uh, in terms of how they work, basically, but please do share. You see, the top loader can be gentle or it can be thorough. It can do a good job of cleaning clothes, in which case it damages them. Or it won't damage your clothes, in which case they come out dirty. It's only the front loader that can be both thorough and gentle. And, of course, save your water. And so we found out that people who used top loaders had more belly button fluff than people who used front loaders. And, because I knew this about washing machines, so we put that in there as a question. And we asked, have you changed from one to the other? And blow me down, if people have gone from a top loader to a front loader, their belly button fluff production went down and vice versa. And then uh, we've got another story of a young woman who was going out for the night in the then popular midriff exposing outfit when her brother said, hey, sis, the story was told by the brother, hey, sis, you've got some belly button fluff. Whereupon um, she immediately went to the bathroom, um, scraped it out with her fingernail and then used not hers, but his electric toothbrush to clean her belly button. And as a result, he came down with the worst fungal infection of his mouth he'd ever had. <laughs> even so, knowing that we were dealing with a, probably a BSL-2 or even 3 biohazard, we asked for samples around the world, and um, we analysed them uh, both under a regular microscope and a light microscope and, and, and an electron microscope. Uh, by the way, very important advice for anybody wanting a career in science communication, 
Remember this, anything, no matter how boring, always looks better under an electron microscope. Never forget that. Very important rule. Um, and then we found that um, belly button fluff was made up of fibers of clothing joined together by dead skin cells. And so I was invited to accept the Ig Nobel Prize and Harvard University showed me so much respect that they provided the accommodation and the flights to Harvard entirely at my own expense. They would not insult me by offering me tawdry money. And the prize itself was a little uh, porcelain tile with a stick uh, glued onto it um, and with Ig Nobel 2001 or two or three written on it in text color, which came off almost immediately. And on a stick with some red chattering teeth on a stick that you'd wind up with uh, a little key. Not quite as, a, as, as fancy as a gold coin. <laughs> well, it was interesting though, because a lot of people I uh, thought I'd won the Nobel Prize, and suddenly they were coming out of the woodwork um, saying I should give them some money. And I can understand that because it's, it's a terrible thing to be poor. One thing I learned as a medical doctor is that poverty is a disease. It leads to a terrible situation where you get all sorts of diseases that you wouldn't get otherwise. Now, moving on to science communication, I'm going to pose you a question, I guess, that so it has a, mm-hmm. it's a frivolous edge, but it's also a serious edge. And I'll leave you to, to think about how you might answer this. So is there a correlation between increasing science communication and an increasing uh, conspiracy theory and science denials? Don't know. Sample size is too small to tell. <laughs> It's, it's too noisy a situation. There's too much, too many complications. So, for example, with the internet, um, that means that you can apply that phrase of Mark Twain, which is that a lie has had a chance to go around the world before the truth has got out of bed and put its shoes on. And the, that's then tied into the fact that we are roughly six times more likely to read an exciting lie than a boring truth. And there's a reason for that, because... If it's exciting and unusual, it could kill us. And so we were always programmed by evolution to look for novel things. And then the trouble is that then you start believing it. And I have believed stupid things in my time. I fell for chlorophyll water when I was a drug-crazed hippie. I admit it. So um, in terms of um, what, how would... And you, your role, you see your role as combating the, I mean, there has been an increase in, you know, particularly in, within climate science and also in vaccination science, uh, an increase in uh, falsehoods and so forth. Do you think the issue is the internet or is it a, a, a bigger problem? And how do we combat that? Uh, well, that's a, it's such a big question. Mm. Part of the problem um, is that we've been in an, in the West an incredibly long period of peace. And if you read um, Thomas Piketty's Capitalism in the 21st Century and Schindler's The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, as you go into a longer and longer period of peace, which is a good thing, you end up with the wealth being distributed so the rich get richer and the poor get screwed. And the rich change the rules so that once they're rich, they change the tax laws so they, get, they pay less tax. Um, and so they get even richer again. And the situation when I was a kid was that one human could run an entire family's income by working one job, 37 and a half or 40 hours a week, and with that, buy a house, buy a car, um, run the family, and um, have a holiday once a year. And now you can't with one person's wages. Um, so we screwed. The toys are cheaper, but but the important things like health and education and welfare and medical, that's um, more expensive. So if people are too busy, then they don't have time to just think and talk because they've got to go out and work. They're working longer hours. So that's one factor. It's a, it's a truly, truly complex situation. Um, and, of course, think of the example of Channel 9 and the current affair. They just wanted to sell dog food, so they told lies about vaccination, and there I am holding a dead baby in my hands at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Direct link, one to the other. It took about a year and a half to happen, but that's the fault of a current affair for starting it up. I'm going to change tack again, and uh, now I particularly target our many students, hopefully, who are watching, and I know you've spoken to so many students and given them advice. So I guess just in case we're missing a few students, what's the number one advice you would give to a student who's thinking, well, what subject should I choose in year 11 or 12, and what should I do if I'm thinking for a career in science? 
doesn't matter. Um, the first degree you get is just the one before your second degree. I do apologise for the fact that the Australian government no longer sees education as a worthwhile investment in the future. I would strongly recommend thinking of going to Denmark or some of the other Scandinavian countries where not only do they provide your education at university level for free and give the lectures in English, they also give you money to rent a flat and also money to live on. And in Germany, the education is free as well. They don't give you money for a flat though. So it doesn't matter. I mean, this is the perfect time in your life when you're coming out of high school and heading off into university to explore all options. When else would you read about medieval paintings, 18th century Mongolian literature and astronomy while you're really interested in doing history or arts, you know, like try all these things. It's all part of the package, but you need that broad education. Um, one problem I am seeing is that people are so specialized that they can't see outside their field and they can't join the boxes together. And I can fully appreciate that they're stuck with having to pay off a big debt because Australia thinks that ed education is not a worthwhile investment in the future for its citizens. Naughty Australian government. Governments, plural, both, all of them. My final question for you, Carl, is um, what are you particularly nerding about at the moment? Maybe not science related. So is there something you, you sell and do it very well, mind you, these wonderful stories in science, but is there something you'd like to teach us about something that you're really passionate about this very minute that's maybe not necessarily science related? Um, I'm doing a story on chlorophyll water. Do you know how much chlorophyll there is in chlorophyll water? None. <laughs> Zero. Nada. Zip, absolutely none. You see, chlorophyll is this amazing chemical that um, it kind of looks like four rings of atoms with, in the middle, an atom of a metal. And there's another molecule like that, hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin's got iron in the middle, and um, it's red in colour, and chlorophyll is sort of greenish in colour. It's got magnesium in the middle. And the trouble with, and there's different types of chlorophyll, six different types, about anything between about 60 and 130 atoms, don't worry about it. So the thing about all the different types of chlorophyll is they don't dissolve in water. Now, what do you want for a superfood? You want just something easy. Hey, folks, potatoes are a superfood. Fix up all your problems just by eating a potato, very expensive, of course, uh, with pay lots of money, and that will, you don't have to do, have a balanced diet or do exercise, just eat the superfood. But you're thinking, bummer, with a superfood, I might have to cook it or, or chew. Obviously, the best, better sort of superfood is something that's just liquid. Here, buy this bottle of expensive liquid for 40 bucks and then just tip some of it into a glass of water and drink it, and that'll cure sunstroke, syphilis, varicose veins, cure cancer. You, the, the claims for uh, chlorophyll water are very large. So the, uh, chlorophyll is not soluble in water. So what they do is they get the chlorophyll molecule from the plants, the, that's organic, and then they take it to a big fat chemical factory and they rip out the magnesium iron and replace it with a copper iron. It's not chlorophyll anymore, but they call it a very similar name, chlorophyll in. They're the letters I and N. Um, uh, so that's the first thing, that the amount of chlorophyll in chlorophyll water is zero. Um, that's what I'm sort of doing a story on at the moment, just, just fascinating me. Um, and the second thing is there are some studies that show benefits, but overwhelmingly they are all really short in terms of the period of time they go for, have a very small number of humans and often don't have control groups. And so there's a bit big of a rush in TikTok. Um, and so I've written this 1,300-word story, which took me about six hours, which I'm going to have to shorten down to less than a minute for TikTok. And when you see these TikTok influencers showing the before and after photos, you have no idea of how much makeup they've put on for the after photograph or the color temperature of the lights that they're using or even the color filters on the TikTok app. You got no idea.
And yeah, so that, that's something I'm following around at the moment. The the other thing is the whole um, getting into space. Um, the Chinese did an amazing thing being able to get to Mars and then orbit Mars. That's, that's pretty hard. And then even more, land on Mars. And then another thing I'm chasing up is lithium. So at the moment, Australia um, provides roughly two-thirds of all the uh, lithium and nickel for uh, the lithium batteries and the Tesla cars. Do we process it in any goddamn way whatsoever? No. We take the dirt out of the ground and we send the dirt overseas. And it's got to the stage where the chairwoman of Tesla has said, look, Australia, you do realise that you're getting $100 million from selling us some dirt, but if you processed it, you could make $1,500 million. You could make more money by processing it. And the Australian government is not putting any long-term thinking into this, which is, um, I'm, I'm trying to, this is a curious situation and I don't think it's amenable to science. I think it's uh, coming out of a different field. You certainly have your uh, strong opinions that certainly science needs to be better funded, better supported within at a governmental level. So, Oh, God, and, and our know, space industry, yeah. our spa the funding for our space industry is roughly equal to our funding for the vaccine from the University of Queensland people, which in each case is roughly one-seventh of the cost of building a pedestrian walkway over a road. We wouldn't even put in as much money as it costs to build a whole pedestrian walkway, <laughs> or 10 of them. No, just one-seventh, five lousy million dollars. It's, um, uh, well, you know... Uh, we just didn't need better and different politicians. So I'll, I'll leave with three messages of hope. The first one is that we can stop and reverse global warming with the technology we have today and bring back the climate and carbon dioxide levels back to what they were in the 20th century. We can bring things back to the way they were with today's technology and it would be cheaper. All we need are different politicians. The reason that the politicians are behaving badly, I suspect, is partly related to the disinformation campaign put out by Big Fossil Fuel of up to a billion dollars a year since 1990. Second bit of good news, um, the people coming through today, the next generation of the smartest ever, it's called the Flynn Effect, smartest ever Flynn Effect, F-L-Y-N-N Effect, um, nine IQ points every generation. And the third bit of good news is that we're living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the su human race. Read uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker and Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Three messages of hope. We can fix it. We just need different politicians. <laughs> Do you see yourself doing this uh, for another 10, 15 years? Yeah, yeah. But the trouble is, um, it's not where the power is. Power, P for power, P for top politics. That's where the power is. So that's the place to be. In the case of us here in Australia, in the Australian Parliament, probably in the Senate as an independent. And then you can have an intelligent vote to make the world a better place for our children and their children. Are you saying you're making a pitch for uh, being a politician? You didn't vote for me in 2007? <laughs> I went for the Federal <laughs> Senate? No, I did not. Uh, but that ah, was, well, I was it's unaware. all your fault. Yeah, I know, it's it, my fault, but I will. <laughs> it's, it's all your fault I didn't get into uh, You and um, 740,000 other people who didn't vote for me. So out of the 780,000 votes needed to get into the Federal Senate, I got 44,000 votes under the line. And um, dear listener, if you don't know what under the line means for a Senate vote, then you just deserve everything that happens to you because you're not being involved with the politics. Support somebody who can get done what you want. Don't vote for the same ones who are denying. It's really weird. I, I, listening to both political parties, it's almost as though they did not know that back in 1973, the insurance companies recognised that global warming was happening. In 1973, they started increasing insurance premiums because of global warming. And the scientists said the same thing, they needed more proof by the late 70s, but to have more proof and make better predictions about how bad it would be, it took them till 1992. So since 1992, it's been as clear as mud, absolutely clear. 
for three decades that we caused it and we can stop it. But they're denying it with a big fact disinformation campaign. Now, now you might think this is hard to believe. You think, would fossil fuel actually tell lies about the real situation? Well, back in August 2018, in every single hospital in Australia appeared a large A0 poster with a picture of a woman's pregnant belly and under it the sentence, it is not known whether drinking alcohol is harmful to the unborn baby of a pregnant woman. That is a lie. Mm. It's been known to be a lie for at least two and a half decades, at least. Why did big alcohol do it? Well, the problem was that there were all these people called pregnant women who were not drinking alcohol. And that was a market that was, you know, not, not big, but, you know, if, if they could get them to drink alcohol, they'd increase their, prob- their profits. They weren't specifically out going out to increase the number of babies born mentally retarded with physical deformities. That was just a collateral damage. Um, why? Nothing personal, just business. Mm. So we need better governance. I'd like to end, Anna, on a, Anna uh, you, what you're saying is really important. Uh, I guess, well, last question as a, just a, as a, as a lighthearted ending. Um, how often is your wife making new shirts? Um, it slowed down a little bit during the COVID-19 crisis, so I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, these shirts are stage clothing. Are you familiar with the concept of stage clothing? Uh, no, but please tell. Ah, I learned that from Bo Diddley. Ah. Yeah, so the stuff you wear on stage is not the stuff you wear around the house, whereas the bands that I was being the roadie for, same stuff. So you wear stage clothing, you know, like the snakeskin boots and the leather jacket with the tassels and um, open over the ribbed, hard-ribbed six-pack of your abs and your giant um, guns on your arms and your flowing, luxuriant hair that you wave back and forth with a wind machine. It's all stage clothing, mate. So um, she's making another one right now, in fact. Um, Takes about three hours from start to finish using a four-thread over locker with differential feed to do 80% of the work and then a regular sewing machine with a buttonhole attachment. Now we've got one finally to do uh, the, the finishing off. And everyone's different. Every single one is different, but they do have a label on them, which is House of Mary, because um, her name is Mary. And I designed the label myself. And so it's got little love hearts, House of Mary with love hearts on each side. Lovely. <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for your time. It's been and not surprisingly, I was expecting to be having a very entertaining, very informative discussion, and you did not disappoint. And I'm sure the listeners, hopefully, um, will, if they don't know you, certainly will read your books. I've got a whole stack of your books in the background, and I encourage my listeners to buy the books because they're fascinating reading, enjoyable reading, and uh, you're a good communicator. And again, I appreciate your time, and thank you so much for, it, for that time. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, my last two books are the first books in the world with holograms. They're the Surfing Safari and Road Trip. So you aim the, you download the Dr. Carl app, aim the camera at the book, and up pops a hologram of a fish that's been dead for a week swimming. And the, the last, last book, of course, is Dr. Carl's little book of climate change. See you later. Look, Paul, thank you ever so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics content. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.